when I first started learning Go, one of the things that I struggled with was how do I structure my applications? And I think I've come up with a pretty good way to structure Go applications now, specifically REST APIs. I actually stole this from a colleague called Ben. So shout out to Ben, give it Ben a shout out in the comment section. So there's a few things that I want in a folder structure. So the number one thing that I want is, not an arrow. The number one thing that I want is I want it to be consistent. So everything that I want to be able to do, I want to be able to do that in a way that is predictable. So if I want to create a new route, there's a strategy for creating new routes. If I want to create a new service, there's a strategy for creating a new service. If I want to make a new database call, there's a strategy for that. So I need my application to be consistent because if anybody else looks at it, then they need to be able to easily predict what is going to happen and how they should work on the application as well. Okay, so the number two thing that I want is I want it to be easy to test. So if my application is not easy to test, then I'm probably going to be shipping in my experience, when your application is easy to test, all these other sort of quality metrics follow that. So if you write your application or structure your application to be easy to test, then it means you sort of thought about the structure upfront and it means that you're going to get these other benefits from that. So I want it to be scalable and I also want it to be not too complicated. So these two things are sort of go hand in hand. If it's too complicated, then it's not going to scale, obviously, because things are just going to be so complicated and difficult to work on that you're just going to get to a point where you can't work on it anymore. So let me show you the structure that I think meets all of this criteria. So this is a side project that I'm working on. And so we start off here in the main. Now the main is where we're going to be registering all of our stuff. So what I mean by that is, for example, you can see we have some Google OAuth config here. We're registering that in the main. You can see that we're registering this token auth package here, and we're doing that in the main. Then we're going to inject these things down into our services and our routes and things like that. So you can see down here, we have all of these stores. So a store is just a place to store data basic. And I'll get into that later on because I think these are a really good example of how dependency injection can really elevate your application structure and make it super simple to test. So these are all the stores that I have. We have some middleware here, and then we're going to use our middleware. We're gonna use some pieces of middleware down here, and then we have our routes. So I have my routes grouped like this. You obviously don't have to group your routes. It's just whatever your application requires. But something that I do that other people probably won't like is I just register all of my routes inside of the main. I think that that is the most obvious place to do this because we could move these out into a routes folder if we wanted, but I just am not sure what we would get out of that. Maybe a less complicated main. While we're in the main, one principle that I like to follow with my main file is to not panic in main. So if we have a look at things that can panic, so for example, when we try connect to the database, I wrap this in a function called must, and must is a convention in Go. And I know when I see a function here that's called must or starts with must, it means that that function can panic. You can see that it's not going to return an error. Let's have a look at this must function. And basically all of this is going to do is it's going to call the open function, and you can see open is private, and then if open returns an error, then we're just going to panic. So you can see it's just simple logic here. You can ignore this part down here. So that's one rule that I like to follow. Don't panic in the main and put that in a must. And then all the other developers know that this function can panic. Okay, so let's have a look at the handlers. So I like to create a new file for each handler. And I like to create a new struct for that handler so I can inject the things that that specific handler needs. So for example, this handler here to create a campaign needs the database and it needs the campaign store. So I have my struct here and then I have my new params. You obviously don't have to use this param struct here if you don't want to, you can just list out your params here. I like to use the struct here just because I like to keep it consistent. Then. I have a function that's going to be called new in front of my create campaign handler. And then it's just going to return a pointer to that handler. And then every single one of these handler structs here 
is going to have one public function, and that one public function is always going to be called serve HTTP. And serve HTTP is only ever going to take two arguments, our response writer and our request object. We then handle the request down here in the body of the function. Another thing to note about this is I've put the request param struct inside of this handler. And the reason that I've done that is because we have a look at the package here, we're in package handlers. So I can move that out and I can put that here. And then let's say this create domain, we have a request body out here in the create domain handler, but we're part of the same package here and Go's not going to allow us to do that. So it's allowing us to do it here because this one's called request body and this one's called request params. But if we change that to request body, then you can see that we're redeclaring it in this block. Even though we're in different files, it's because we're in the same package. So I like to just put this down inside of the handler. It's no big deal and it works. Okay, let's go to HTTP handler. So this is just a little utility function that I like to write. So it's called HTTP errors, and this just allows me to keep my errors consistent. So it has two functions. One is just write, and it takes our response writer, it takes a code, and it takes a message. And if we use this function, we're going to return a consistent error message every single time. And we also have write f, which is going to do the same thing, but it allows us to format the message. Then we have our middleware, and our middleware follows the same sort of pattern. So we have a struct for our middleware, we have our params, and then we have a new function that is going to return a pointer to the struct. And then we have our methods on the struct. So I have one here for requiring a user. We have some cause middleware, and then we have my authentication middleware here. Okay, so let's have a look at store, and I think this is where this sort of pattern really shines, or this sort of file structure really shines. Okay, so in store, we have a store.go, and this store.go belongs to the package store. And this is just sort of a generic outline of what store can do. So one, I have all of my models. These are just the structures that we can create. So each one of these is gonna have its own store. So that's just the base model. Each one of these, like user and company and session, are gonna have their own store. Then down the bottom here, we're going to have interfaces for all of these stores. So let's have a look at what a store looks like. Have a look at campaign store. So you, you can see that this is now part of package DB store because you can have lots of different storage mechanisms, right? You can have a database, you could have a key value store, you could have just in memory. And right now we're using a database store. So again, each one of our stores follows a similar pattern. We're going to create our struct then we're going to have our params for creating that struct. And then we're going to have a new function that returns a pointer to that struct. So you'll notice here, our store doesn't actually take in our database. The reason it does that is because for each one of these functions here, I want to use a transaction. So in this case, the handlers are responsible for creating and committing that transaction. So you can see here, create campaign takes its own transaction. So in here, we have a bunch of functions that we can call on that store. So we're going to have our creates, our deletes, our updates, our gets, that sort of thing. And I like to separate these database calls out into a database store instead of just having the handlers do their own database calls for two main reasons. One, we can do things like this where we log out how long this function took to run. And right now I'm just using a logger and that's sort of okay but what I really should be doing is capturing some sort of metric. So I would time this and I would put that into something like Prometheus. And then I'll be able to see a histogram of my database calls. And if I have one database call that is much longer or takes much longer than all the other ones, I can then look at optimizing that specific database call. But if these are all bundled up inside of our handlers, finding those pain points or finding those bottlenecks is going to be really difficult. So this is why I like to do this. The second reason I like to do this is because now I can mock these functions out. So I can write a test and in that test, I don't actually have to connect to a database. I can just say that expect create campaign to be called with X, Y, and Z. 
So a lot of people don't like mocks. I think they're extremely helpful because it allows you to spin up really quick, fast running tests. And you can test the business logic inside of your handlers without having to start up a database or have any of those issues that come with integration tests. Integration tests are obviously really important, but you want to have that baseline of really fast running tests to start off with. Okay, so how do I inject this in and mock this out? So let's have a look at our handlers. So if we go to our create campaign handler, and you can see that this is taking a campaign store. Now this campaign store is actually just an interface. So inside of the handlers, I pass in the interface instead of the struct. So we have a look in the main where we're creating this struct. So campaign store, if we hover over that, you can see that this is a pointer to DB store campaign store. Now that is the struct. But this function down here expects to take the interface. And because that struct satisfies the interface, then we can pass in that struct. So we can create another struct that also satisfies that interface and we'll call that struct a mock. So inside of the DB store, I like to have a folder and that's called mock. Inside of there, there's a file called mock and that belongs to the package mock. So whenever I create a mock, let's say I created a mock for HTTP error, I would put that in the mock package as well. So you can see here we have this struct campaign store mock, and this is also going to satisfy the interface that we can pass in to that create campaign handler. So let's have a look at this in action. This is the outline of what would be a test, but this is a side project and we don't test in side projects, or at least not yet. So this test is not fully functioning, but I think that you'll be able to see how you can use these mocks inside of your tests. So you can see here, we have this OAuth callback handler params, and this takes a bunch of these store interfaces. And then you can see we're creating new instances of these mock stores. So this is just a new instance of this struct here. And these struct, this user store mock, has all of these methods on it. And therefore, it's going to satisfy that interface. So the one way you can use this is, let's say, let's have a look at this function, this OAuth callback, and see where our user store is being used. So you can see our user store is being called with create user. So let's grab that. So now we can say mock user store dot on create user. And you can see this nil and nil here. So let's have a look at what we are calling the function with. So you can see here, we're calling it with our transaction. So we don't want that to be nil. This can be mock dot anything. So that's just going to be anything's going to pass. And therefore our transaction here is going to pass. Now we have nil here, but what we really want is we want this user. So in my test case, I would have create user expected params, and that would be a type of store.user or a pointer to store.user. Now inside of our test, we would say that this is TC dot create user expected params. Now, if we call this function without these expected params, then our test is not going to pass. And we can assure that all of our mocks were called by saying mock user store dot assert expectations. And we can pass in our testing function here. And this is going to make sure that this function was in fact called. Now, I personally think that this is a really good test especially because it is so fast to run and they're so cheap to write. So you can also specify what this function would return. So you can come up here and you can say, create user results. And this is going to be a stored at user. And we can have create user error. Now we can pass these in tc.create user results and tc.create user error. So now we can handle both cases of when this function throws an error or returns an error, and when this function returns the user as we expect it to.
So that's the basics of how I like to structure my Go applications. If you have any questions or suggestions on how I can improve this, let me know in the comment section below. If you want an example of a application that is structured like this, the Goth stack that I created is structured exactly like this. I basically cloned that to create this. You can see that I'm still referencing Goth. So I'll link to that in the description below. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.